Welcome to the Prep Pigskin Report Podcast, hosted by Papa Pig himself, Paul Rudy. Uh, welcome to PPR Podcast number 24. Everybody knows Bert Grossman. My name is Paul. And in the hot seat, uh, this particular podcast is Michael Brunker. Michael, who is uh, known for a variety of things, including being a former assistant basketball coach at SDSU, ran the Jackie Robinson YMCA for a very long time. He is what they describe as a mover and shaker in our community, Bert. You forgot 2019 Mr. San Diego. 2019 Mr. Uh, well, if, if you go to his LinkedIn uh, uh, page, Michael, uh, you must have a trophy case the size of uh, a bank vault because you have won just about every honor given to a citizen here in San Diego State. So uh, I think it's safe to say you are a major player in our community. Uh, it, it takes a team effort, so I'm happy to be at the table with so many folks, including you two today. This is exciting. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, a departure of sorts from... Our, you know, we, 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 it's a high school football podcast, but I think what sparked this was an interview you and I did on Good Morning San Diego, not the most recent one, but the one prior, and you were talking about how the PPR could play a bigger role in the community. And I, I think maybe we should just pick it up right there. Could you elaborate on what you were trying to explain to a simpleton like me? Well, I... Uh, I'll tell you, Paul, you, you've done so much to really change the, you know, just the landscape of prep sports here in San Diego County. I'm being born and raised in Detroit and understanding the importance of that. And, and when I was in high school, my junior and senior year played on two, what we back then called mythical state championship teams <laughs> because they didn't, they didn't have state championships in Michigan like, like they did in basketball. But we were ranked number one for most of the year. And um, I played at St. James and Ferndale, played for the legendary John Shada. And uh, my, my senior year, we went undefeated. And, and the story in, in that season is that at halftime of our first game, uh, Coach Shada had a heart attack, and he died later that evening. And we came out for the rest of the season wearing those black armbands on, on our sleeves. And every time I talked to somebody that played on the opposing teams, they said they didn't want to play us in the first place. But when we came out with those black armbands, it was a whole different perspective. So, But, but, but when you look at sports, and sports has been a huge part of my life, and uh, – so many great leaders have emerged. And, and, and I'll start with where I lived in Detroit. Uh, baseball was big, obviously, the Tigers. And it was on my 11th birthday when Ernie Harwell, who was the Jerry Coleman for the Detroit Tigers, he pulled my mother's postcard out of a barrel. And she won his and hers cars on the day before my 11th birthday, which really transformed our lives. We moved uh, out of, you know, we, were, we lived in Detroit, in the city. And then moved a couple miles a little further towards the city limits. But it impacted me in so many ways. But when we did move, living two houses from me on the right, and you're both football players right now, you know the legendary Dick Knight Train Lane sure. lived yeah. on the corner two houses away from me. And Train was Hall of Famer. He's, I mean, he was one of the, I mean, they outlawed two tackles on him, the clothesline and the face, right. whatever he did. But he, he was uh, just an unbelievable football player. But off the field, just an absolute gentleman and first-class guy, and, and he was the founder. Well, he wasn't the founder, but he ran the Police Athletic League in Detroit, which is one of the many programs that I was raised on in Detroit that really helped protect me from myself as a kid growing up. And so to have the good counsel of two houses on the right, Dick Knight Train Lane, two houses on the left, was another Hall of Famer, wasn't a sports Hall of Famer, but was Melvin Franklin of the Temptations, the guy that had the deep voice. He lived two houses on the other side of me. And so it was that kind of mentorship that I received as a young middle schooler, high schooler, from people that told me the right things and gave me good guidance and counsel. And so when we look at the abundance of just tremendous talent that's on the athletic fields today, and, and in particular football, you look at what, what's going to happen to kids after the game, you know, when they're done, and, and what can they do to become better leaders to really be inspirational to so many others, especially in their own high schools, to really help improve the quality of life for not only them as students, but their classmates, their school community, their families, whatever it might be. Uh, and I believe too that there are kids right now that are doing great things outside of sports that we just don't hear about. And, and so in, in your view, the PPR could do a better job of maybe putting a spotlight on those kids. You can, and I, and I believe it. I, I think, and what it does is it gives the example that you got to be bigger than the game. You know, it's 
there's more to it than just the game. And, and, and even I admirably for both of you right now, you know, what, what, and all of us, when we, we ended our sporting career, our playing days are over with. And even though we get better as we get older, right. <laughs> but, at the, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to do something else with your life. And so my wife and I have been married 45 years. We have five children. Four of our kids played NCAA full scholarship athletes. You wow. know, the boys played football, the girls played basketball. And, and when I go to games today and I sit in the stands and, and I see every parent thinking their kid's going to get a scholarship, every parent thinks their kid's going to play major league, you know, something. Well, they're not. And, and that, But what are we doing to prepare kids for the biggest game of all, the game of life? And, and I believe PPR could be a leader in that form. That's, you know, that's the part I miss being our age. Remember back in the day, you, you remember, you could be two years removed at a bar and say you're an All-American and nobody could check on it because it wasn't <laughs> the internet. <laughs> Everybody's two years removed All-American. Michael, I mean, you bring up Pal, and I grew up in Philadelphia, and we had Pal, and mm -hmm. we were part of you the know. boxing program. Yeah, and, and it was amazing. I know, and you started yeah. here, but I know you, Star Pal's not the same as Pal. I mean, to me anyway. Right. I mean, I've experienced it both. How did it transition from... Pal, because we used to do boxing, um, you do football, baseball. You, I mean, you pretty much do everything, and, and you'd have a mentor. And yeah. it's not really the same anymore. I'll tell you, I wrote a piece when I when I came to the Police Athletic League. And, and what happened for me, is, as many of you know or may not know, I came to San Diego in 1980 to coach basketball at San Diego State. So prior to that, born and raised in Detroit, I was an assistant coach with the Detroit Pistons. And four years before that, with, at the University of Detroit, Worked with Dick Vitale for six years. And so I came here in 1980. We had some a great run here. and and But when I left coaching in 87, decided to stay in San Diego, I founded the Police Athletic League. And it was based on simply, you know, law enforcement and civilian volunteers providing healthy opportunities for kids. Just like you grew up, Bird, in Philadelphia. I grew up on it in Detroit. And, and we launched it. And, and But I also wrote a piece, too, why it's easier to join a gang than it is to join a team. And for three basic reasons. One is there's not enough fund or facilities, safe facilities where kids can walk comfortably to those facilities. It could be a rec center, it could be a park. But I mean, at the Jackie Robinson Family YMCA, for example, there are 52 gang sets in our service area that a lot of people don't realize, and they're still going strong. So they haven't gone away. The second reason is there's not enough funding. If you've got kids, you know how much it costs to put kids in the sports right now and club sports in particular, which are taking over everything, which is eliminating the grassroots sports programs like the police athletic league and the things we did right. back in Detroit and Philadelphia. And then the third birth there's not enough adult volunteers that are going to step up and be those old school coaches. And I mean, and I'm talking about the coaches, not the coaches that have kids on their team, you know, their own kids, but they're coaching everyone else's kids too. And it's for me in Detroit, it was the Bernie Holowickies of the world that, you know, helped do these things for me when I started playing sports. And so when you look at PAL right now, we our funding was based on seized asset forfeitures at the time. So back there was a time where, where if, you, if there was a drug bust or whatever related, I mean, whatever funds came out of that, whether they'd be the money, the houses, the cars, whatever, uh, they sold them. And, and a lot, large part of that was diverted into what was then called the San Diego Regional Police Athletic League. We were countywide. We had it pr practically every law enforcement agency involved. But funding really dictates a lot of that. Facilities dictate a lot of it. And I think right now it's, um, but it still can be big. And, and I think right now, when you look at PPR right now, I mean, what if the student athletes on every high school football team became volunteer coaches at a rec center or at a YMCA or at a boys and girls club. You know, those are the things they can be doing. I, I, I know that for many uh, young soccer players, they get paid big money to officiate soccer right. games. And so they can become officials. They could, there's a lot they can do to become the next coaches. I know I started coaching just on a lark when I was, uh, I, I left, I played basketball for one year at the university of Detroit and then left because my father had open heart surgery back in 1970 and there was no income coming into the family so i need to get a job in addition to continuing my education and the job i got was as a custodian at a catholic school out in southfield michigan st Bees in southfield and one sunday they had a basketball game and everybody knew i played because i'd be hanging out in the gym all the time and i set the gym up and they had the game and this team didn't win a game the year before at halftime of that first game that sunday they were down by 15 or 20 
and the teacher who was the coach asked me to come in and ask, you know, ask if I could have any pointers or tips to help them get back in the game. And so I ended up coaching the team in the second half. We won the game, went undefeated that year, won the uh, CYO City Championship, you know, for for Detroit. And, and and it launched my career on to Brother Rice High School in Birmingham, Michigan, and then with the University of Detroit. But it's what we can do beyond sports. And, and I think that's where if we don't really give young people the opportunity up for leadership, and this is where coming off the King Day holiday in particular, Paul, which is where you and I started this conversation, you know, if you study the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was a leader in everything that he said thought and did with his head, his heart, his hands, and his habits. And and right now, athletes are leaders. You know, there's no doubt in my mind. I'm looking at Lucky Sultan, who got the prep pip skin with whatever, you know, the big award this year, but where would he be without his lineman? You know, where right. would he be without his coaches? And I think he's learned, he's probably forgot more about leadership than most people will ever learn. And how can we put that into the real world practicality ways of, of doing great things that are going to make an impact? And I think, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with San Diego High, Charles James. Um, I'll give yes. you an example. So that place was a disaster as far as a program. Um, you get somebody to come in there for a $3,000 stipend. Um, he becomes mentor, college advisor, rideshare, tutor. You know, 10 or 15 kids a year going to college now. Um, that lifts 30 or 40 other kids on the team, and that 40 or 30 other kids lift two, three, 400 kids on campus. Yet you lose a guy. You lose a guy like that because the administration will not even give him an inch for anything, and I, and I think that's where it becomes a problem. Or you, or you could take David Dunn and um, at Lincoln. I mean, that place was a two-win disaster, and now 10, 15 kids are going to college every year. And, and to be honest with you, I'd much rather have that on my team if I'm a head coach than a than a say championship. But again, they always have to fight with the administration. At Lincoln, it's always a new administration every one or two years, and then you have to start all over. And isn't that the problem at some point? Well, at some point, but but I think that when you look at the courageous endurance that, you know, Charles and David and others like them, they, they stick it out. You know, Jeff Harper Harris is another one. You know, he's, you know, he, he all that he's done at Lincoln as a basketball coach, and he launched a Coaches for Racial Equality. They just completed a big tournament over the King Day holiday where, you know, coaches and teams came together in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but people hang with it. And it, it. It's not about the money. You know, teachers the same way. I mean, look at the teachers that are in the game right now. They're not doing it for the money, but they're doing it for the love of the kids. And thank God they are. But I think, too, that what, you know, if, if as we wrap around it and we elevate their stories and we let people know what needs to happen. But I think, uh, Bert, you hit on a key part right there is the it's the transition of leadership, too. You know, and, and I'm looking at what we accomplished at the Jackie Robinson Family YMCA. Could I have raised $40 million to build a new Jackie Robinson family YMCA if I'd only been there three years, you see? So, I mean, I was there 22 and a half years and 23 with the Y, but I think the credibility that you build by being entrenched in a community, knowing the families, you know, serving downstream, building your public value, your legitimacy and support, and then your operational capacity, and then you do great things. And I know these coaches right now, I talk to involved with many mentorship programs right now, and and a lot of times people are looking at that one-on-one -on -one mentor. You know, those days are over with right now. There's not enough right. mentors yeah. to go around with the kids that need mentorship. And coaches, in my mind, have been the best mentors ever for the same reason Bert, you just mentioned. I mean, they, they, you look at how they that one person amplifies where they are. And I know I stand on the shoulders of the Bernie Holowickys, the John Shaders, the Sam Washingtons, you know, all these great coaches that I had, the Dick Vitals, you know, people like that that have really helped, you know, get me to where I am today. Hey, can I ask one? I, I know you guys are having a serious conversation. I, I, I just always wanted to ask you, who was, who, remember the starting five of that Pistons team that you were the assistant coach on? What did what, what, that team consist of? This team had uh, the, the guy that set all the NBA assist records before uh, before Magic Johnson, and, and Burt will know, probably yeah. remember this guy, a guy by the name of Kevin Porter. Yeah. You know, <laughs> little Kevin Porter was mm -hmm. one. Our center was Bob Lanier. Uh, we had John Long and Terry Tyler were rookies at the University of Detroit. So, you know, Dick Vitale drafted them really fast. But we had ML Carr. We had Chris sure. Ford. We had Leon Douglas. We had Bob McAdoo for a while. You know, so we we had some uh, – it, it was a fun – names. We didn't win a lot of games. The first game, we – we won maybe 30 plus games. The second year was uh, Dick. Dick Dick actually got fired. So the story is he got the Ziggy after six games, and and then he became the first uh, broadcast, you know, color commentator 
for ESPN. He, he did the first ESPN right. game, and his, his uh, career is legendary. Now. Well, we wish him well as he battles cancer. So, uh, hey, uh, just quickly, what was that life like living a... I, I know now it's gotten a little more comfortable, but going from town to town as an NBA assistant coach, that, that had to be a hard life. Well, part, part of it was, um, first off, I was young, too. You know, I was yeah. the youngest assistant coach in the NBA. I was 20, 26 years old, you know. So when I came to the NBA and coaching players, it, it meant, many of them were older than I was at the time. But it, it was on the road a lot. That's part of the reason why I left it in two, in, after two years and came out to San Diego State. I actually made more money as an assistant coach at San Diego State than I did at the Pistons at the time. We didn't get the salaries back then in, in 19, what was it, 1980. Uh, 78 to 80 those salaries weren't the same as they are right now but I came to San Diego State and and didn't regret it one bit and 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 a lot of it is because of San Diego and because of the great people that are here including the two of you and I think this is where the influence that we have over young people through sports and, and and I think Paul the other thing I was looking at too is when my kids were in school high school sports in the San Diego Union Tribune was more predominant I mean you could play a game one night and you'll see the score the next day it's not happening now. You don't see high school sports scores anymore unless you're tuning in to p- the PPR for football. And, and I wish we could do the same for all the sports. I see you're doing more of that with other sports as well. But sports to kids today is so important because it teaches them so much. I know for me, the lessons I learned were, you know, it, it, it helped me in so many ways. But I truly believe that the kids that are running, pressing, shooting, punt, passing, kicking, tackling, doing all those things right now, could be our next mayors. They could be our next CEOs. They could, they could be the next executive directors of the Jackie Robinson family YMCA. And maybe one day hit up PPR when Paul Rudy hands it off to somebody and sit here and do this podcast themselves. <laughs> but how cool would it be to hear their voices and listen to their dreams of what they want to do with sports into the future? Michael, that day is a lot closer than you know. Oh, but he's not. He's never. You see, he still has Shaq lit on. Shaq's 107 years old. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he's waiting on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just talking about your mentorship, and, and I agree with you, the coaches in my life, be it from Little League all the way to the, to the college level, they're the most important people, adults in my life, other than my mom and you know, my parents. So what's the biggest, best coaching advice perhaps that you received that, that you turned around and gave? Well, for me, you know, it, it isn't, it's the advice I've got from the players, you know, and right now, and, and, and sometimes you just don't know if you're making an impact. Burke can probably understand this because I'm sure we've had probably had many coaches where the coaches wanted, am I getting through to that person or not? But, but I think to understand that it's, coaching is a process, not a race. It's a combination of direction and support, you know, and I think when you look at the great coaches right now, it's all situational. And speaking of situational leadership, I know you all know Ken Blanchard. You've heard the name. You know he's a leader in leadership training right now. And right. what's happening Thursday and Friday of this week, uh, the Blanchard Companies has a nonprofit called the Blanchard Institute, which is a situational leadership training program for middle school, high school, and college-age students. And so what's happening Thursday and Friday is they've invited uh, a group of thought leaders to come together to determine how we could reimagine the Blanchard Institute to make sure that every young person can get this training so that they know how to handle situations in life that need leadership. And I think that's the key thing right now is how do you give kids a chance to play the game and get them, you know, right now, you, sometimes you can overcoach a kid too. You can underestimate a coach. You, you, you don't really, you know, and you get surprised at what young people can do if you don't give them the tools to be successful. Great movies have been made about it. Uh, I love the movie Hoosiers. I, I, yeah. I was part of a team at, at Brother Rice High School in 1974 that won a state championship. And the legendary Hall of Fame coach Bill Norton was a Bobby Knight before his time. And he hired me in as his first varsity assistant coach. And, and we won the state championship. And a lot of it has to do with how do you communicate with your players? How do you trust them? How do they trust you? And then, Paul, in, in Bert, it's, it's weeks like this where – you know, I'm on a phone call with John Long, who played 15 years in the NBA and played for us at the University of Detroit. And to have get coaches from your former players where they're calling you up, checking in with you, and then always end the call with letting them know how much they love you. Uh, and and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Then I got a text yesterday from John who let me know his oldest brother had passed away and was called to be with the Lord. Now, 
for John Long, he was one of 16 kids. He was the youngest of 16. Wow. And every time we played a game at the University of Detroit, his entire family was sitting in the front row. So it's, when we deal with kids in sports and as coaches, it's about the family. It's not about their sports ability. It's about where you're gonna, what, what's going to happen when, you're, when they're done playing. You know, are they still calling you then? That's why they call you coach. And, and, and I'm just so honored that so many of my former players still call me coach to this day. Wow. So you bring that up, the Bobby Knight thing. And, and you know, it's obvious he wouldn't be able to coach today, that, that kind of thing. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because you look at Todd Graham, who just resigned from University of Hawaii football coach, um, Senate hearings, everything else, because he used some distressing language to some 20 year olds. And, and you look at Bobby Knight yeah. and the impact he had with a lot of his players that love him and legendary and but you know there's a 30 or 40 it. year difference but okay. is there a happy medium in between because you couldn't be one or the other today you're right and, and it's the times they are a change right <laughs> <They've> <laughs> so, changed. And, and, and i think too is you know I, I i don't know how many kids you have but i've got five and i have five grandchildren and, and another one on the way and, and so i know that uh the, the way we were raised the way we may have raised our kids uh, it's not working like that anymore. So I, I look back as when I was a coach, I know I, I made a lot of errors. I'll be the first to admit I probably wasn't, in my eyes, the best coach that, that, you know, at that time. But but sometimes you've got to be sensitive enough to understand it's situational with everybody. You know, when you look at a player today, and I'll give you an example. If you look at your staff or, or even the team that you're associated with today, and Bert, when you played the game, I want you to categorize those teammates in one of the four following categories. And this is what Blanchard teaches right now. Number one, enthusiastic beginners. Number two, disillusioned learners. Number three, cautious but capable. And number four, high achieving peak performers. Now, I want you to think about your teammates. I want you to think about your fam your kids, right? I, I want you to think about your coworkers. I know I'm number two already. And, 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 and as you that. put them all into that group, you know, I'm sure we want to all assess ourselves being high achieving peak performers, but someone else might assess us as being something different, right? Mm -hmm. But but let's say you look at those four categories, what all of this means, and this is what we're trying to teach young people with the Blanchard Institute right now, and what we're going to be reimagining on Thursday and Friday, is how can you teach a young person when they get into a situation and they meet somebody to quickly diagnose, are they one of those four? If they're an enthusiastic beginner, they don't need hugs. All they need is a list. Tell them what to do. They're committed. They've got a high commitment. They've got high capacity. They just need to be told what to do. If they're a disillusioned learner, these are the people that you don't want to deal with. They, they got all the answers. They don't want to listen to anything. But you, these are the hardest ones. And, and God bless those coaches that dealt with those kind of players by giving them the direction and support, the hugs, the you know, affirmations they need. To, until they get to be that high achieving peak performer. The cautious but capable are people we know can do the job. They just lack the confidence. You got to keep telling them they can do it. It could be that next man up, Paul. It could be, you know, when there's an injury to a player and someone steps in. And, and I really get tired of hearing about all these teams, that, even the UCLA scenario. I mean, UCLA lament the fact that they lost all the, the starting, the, you know, defensive line to COVID. But Every depth chart I've ever looked at showed three or four deep. Yeah. I mean, they didn't have exactly. enough players to play yeah. deep. At, you know, and so you're going to cancel a game four or five hours beforehand. That didn't make any sense to me. But it's the next man up, and sometimes all they need is that chance. And I don't know if you were in San Diego when Marshall Falk played his first yeah. game, but if you if you understand it, he did not start that game. He got in the game because whoever the running back was in front of him fumbled like two or three times and Marshall got in and set an NCAA record at the time, almost 400 yards. And so it's the next man up concept. You give them the confidence they'll be successful. And then those high achieving peak performers like Paul Rudy and, and Bert Grossman right here, you just get out of the way. <laughs> they know what to do. They're coming to you saying, can I do A, B, and C? And Paul, this is what I really admire about you is that you said you're going to do something and you did it. So oftentimes people talk about doing things and they never do it. And here, less than a week later, we're talking about what more can we do to elevate the prep pigskin report and those athletes that you touch every Friday. Well, you might have another job title come fall. PPR is director. We'll have, we have to fit you for <laughs> engagement for, for for a red jacket. Hey, uh, qu quickly, the third option. Can you? Uh, when I th when I hear third option, I think of uh, I think of an an NBA team. You always have to have three options. Uh, three options for scoring. Is that where that title came from? 
No, the third option is a book that Miles McPherson wrote, who we all uh, know dearly and love him dearly. And it was a book he wrote a couple of years ago. And, and the third option is simply, you know, in, a, in, in an effort to unite the country one city at a time and an us versus them society, a you against me society. The third option is what do we have in common that we can all come together and, and really resolve our differences. And so I was blessed to have the opportunity to, uh, when I retired from the YMCA of San Diego County in January, uh, a year ago, January of 2021, I refired with Miles and helped launch the Third Option City with him. I started out as a CEO and then became the uh, mission advancement officer for that. And basically that program is growing by leaps and bounds. And, and it's really dealing with uniting the country one city at a time by developing loving relationships that honor our similarities and celebrate our uniqueness. And as you know, the book was based, it's Bible based, it's scripture based, but Miles also developed a secular version that can be used in businesses and schools and whatever path it might be so that everybody can get this DEI training and, and really focus on, you know, the things that are really important in terms of making a difference in terms of uniting people through blind spots and, and you know, in, 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 in groups and out groups and, and, uh, and a brother, sister keeper. There's six tenants there that, you know, people could really focus on. And, and many law enforcement agencies have participated in it. Schools participated in it, churches participated in it, and it's just another way of really showing leadership. And, and as you know, Miles not only wrote that book, but he wrote another book yeah, called yeah. Do Something, right? And the Do Something concept is, I mean, once again, a lot of people sit around talking about doing something, but they never do. Why not make an impact? And, and as you know, if, I know both of you have been to the new Jackie Robinson family YMCA, and when you walk in the door, when you look to the right, there's that famous picture of him sliding home. And then there's that great quote that says, a life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives. And, and the question is, what kind of impact are we having every day? And I think we can all do more. So let me ask you a question on that, because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time at Hoover, and I think we used to boast at Hoover. There was 34 different languages spoke there. And you talk about connecting community is... You know, when we grew up, it was you were black or white, pretty much. That's all you were. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't even connect it to then. I mean, has it become harder now when you're dealing with, you know, 30 or 40 different cultures at, at these melting pots now that, that you try to connect? And, I mean, isn't that a daunting task now? It is a daunting task. And it, but with the proper knowledge, you could be successful, right? And so I know I was on a call uh, last night with Standing in the Gap which is a group of black pastors and, and many law enforcement, uh, retired law enforcement folks, and standing in the gap between community and uh, the police chiefs and sheriff's association. So th there's a number of things that, that we've discussed with them on both sides. And, and a lot of that talked about how do you communicate with, it all comes down to communication and understanding of what those, you know, what those cultures bring to the table. And, and, and so there's a website through the county district attorney's office that talks about, and they actually have the different communities, African-American, the Hispanic, with, you know, whatever it might be, the Asian, Pacific Islanders, and the cultural traits for law enforcement, because you talk about a training, it's not just coaching those kids, but what about a police officer who doesn't right. look like anybody in the community and they're <laughs> stepping in trying to do their job? Oh, yeah, it's a daunting task if you are not prepared, properly trained, but I'll even go a step further, Bert, and say you've got to be rightfully recruited to the job you're about to do, right? And so, uh, I don't know where you put. Where'd you play your college ball at? Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. You, you played at Pitt, and Pitt was a powerhouse, you know. And and and, and I mean, I remember those days. And when you look at that, when they recruited you, they you were rightfully recruited to do the job, and they and they obviously were successful because you went and played beyond Pitt as well. So the key right now. It's just like recruiting. I was in the recruiting game all those years in coaching, right? It's not just the X's and O's and coaching the kids, but, you, you know, the Kentucky Derby was never won with a mule, right? you got to recruit the right <laughs> yeah. kids that are going to fit your program and fit your culture and, and fit your system and do the things that you need to. But when you go into somebody's home, and I, and I suspect, Bert, when, when people would go into the homes of the kids, and I don't know if you lived around Pittsburgh or not, but in Detroit, I, I was just talking to somebody the other night when, going into the home of a family where the kid that we're recruiting might be the first in the family to go to college. And we're getting ready to offer these young people a scholarship and parents who may have been employed in the auto industry, working in the factories, would debate us about why their kid didn't need a college degree. 
because they could make more money working in the assembly line at Ford General Motors of Chrysler. And, and I'll tell you right now, I remember back when I was 19 years old, making almost $20 an hour, I was doing that. You know, in the heat treat plants, you could make the money that you had to. So, you know, what are you gonna do with that degree? And then when you look now too, as kids get degrees and what are they doing it with it? You know, are the jobs there, are the careers there? So, so it, you've got to understand how to communicate with those families. It's different, the cultures are different, but you can do it if you're committed to it. Boy, Michael, my, my recruiting trip didn't, <laughs> every, every visit was the same, Michael. It was Philadelphia, yeah. mid eighties. Coach would come in, him and my dad would get drunk, smoke two pack cigarettes. I'd go to my girlfriend's, come back and ask for money to go to school there. <laughs> That was it. That's oh, right. <laughs> you, 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 well, it was the eighties. Come on, Michael. We have yeah. to call it a conversation. I, I appreciate you being so generous with your time. As we wrap this up, do you got a good Smokey Gain story or a good Dick Vitale story that we can leave this? Oh uh, man. What's your What's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you in the in the world of sports? I got a good well, Smokey Gain. Well, tell you, <laughs> Smokey Gaines, and you both knew Smokey, I'm yeah. sure. Smokey was great. Now, Smokey and I were both assistant coaches for Dick at the University of Detroit. And so when Dick um, got the job with the Pistons, uh, he, there was a year between U of D and the Pistons where uh, he, so he resigned in the fall of that season and Smokey quickly became the, the head coach. And Dick was the athletic director at the time. And, but when Smokey came out here to San Diego State and you know he would call me every day when I was still with the Pistons trying to get me to come out here, tell me how beautiful San Diego was. And then uh, I came in May of, of 1980, and Tony Gwynn's our point guard. You know, it was a, Michael Cage was a freshman at the time, and so we, we get ready to go on those infamous WAC uh, road trips, and and uh, and we would fly into Denver to play Colorado State, to play <laughs> Air Force, and then go up the hill to Laramie, Wyoming. Man. And so I'll never forget it. And every time we go on the road trips, you fly into Denver, you take the bus up to Laramie. And every time the bus would break down, man, there'd be something around the heat wouldn't work or something like that. So it's my first trip to Laramie. And if you've ever been to the old arena they had, it was, they also had rodeos. in. So it was a dirt floor. It was a big, tall stand up floor, you know, elevated floor, like at the University of Minnesota. And, and so it, it was that kind of facility. And we go in there and um, for the game and, and we actually go in there for a practice. And, 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 and everybody's concerned about the elevation. And so Smokey talked about how the arena was pressurized. Oh, God. <laughs> and, there was, and there was no, don't worry about the elevation. And so those guys were running sprints up and down the floor, and people are getting ready to fall out. You know, they, they couldn't believe it. And then, um, and then so we get ready to go for the game. And so Jim Brandenburg is the coach at the time. And, and, the, and, you know, the players get off the bus. They're the first ones in the locker room. And then by the time I get into the locker room, Brandenburg would have with the oranges that they'd give you at halftime, he had a big box of Hershey's chocolate. And so those guys are eating the Hershey's chocolate before the game in the altitude. And you know we lost by four. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it was, that was That's the biggest lie in coaching. The altitude's a myth. Don't worry about it. It's yeah. the biggest lie in coaching. Yeah. Michael, we have yeah. to go. We, we have a, we're up against a news break here, so we got to call it a conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we start posting this, I believe, if not tonight, tomorrow, and, and I'll make sure to send you a link, okay? Okay, and then, yeah, let me know how I can help. I want to be a part of the solution. Oh, yeah. Uh, trust me, you haven't seen the last of me. Yes, yeah. God All bless. right. Thank you.